Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm very proud of you being here after lunch. Um, <laughs> and thanks, Alice, for the introduction. So you know you can say live with JavaScript? Um, really, I'm, I'm not kidding. You can. You'll see. However, this is not necessarily an easy path. Uh, we have been doing that for the past uh, 13 months, um, and writing JavaScript offline applications to fight the Ebola outbreak. And we have made a lot of mistakes and find a lot of challenges. And we have learned a lot. And I want to share with you the, the challenges, the mistakes, and the learnings. So maybe, I don't know, maybe it will save you some pain if you work with offline applications. So all right. Ebola, um, I'm sure you all know a lot about Ebola because it has been in the media quite often in the past year and a half. But I'm just going to review the facts um, that will help you understand how to fight it. So we don't know much about Ebola. One of the things we don't know is how to cure it. Uh, the way to treat it nowadays is just to bring people to a um, medical facility and keep them strong and hydrated and treat the symptoms so that the body can deal with the virus itself. However, Ebola has some good parts in comparison with some um, other diseases in what regards the, as the spread. One is that contagion requires direct contact with body fluids, so it's not airborne like a cold. And also, uh, infected people are only contagious after they develop symptoms, unlike the flu, where you are giving it to other people and you don't even know you are sick yet. We also know that the incubation period is up to 21 days. And the way to fight Ebola is uh, mostly what is called contact tracing. Um, when you find somebody that is sick with Ebola, you, of course, first bring them to a hospital, um, provide them with care, and be careful to keep them isolated from other patients, because Ebola is very contagious. But uh, the second thing you do is to find out everybody that has, has a significant contact with that person in the last days. And, and these people are potentially infected with Ebola too. So what you have to do is um, check on them for 21 days, follow up on them for 21 days, and see if they develop symptoms. If they don't, then it's awesome, they are free. Um, if they do, then you have to start the process again. So there are two important parts here for, for stopping the sickness from spreading. One is, like, one is contact tracing. The other one is to find infected people as soon as possible so you can help them, and also so you prevent them from infecting other people. Um, for that, this was not so easy in, in the Ebola countries in West Africa, like in Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. There were really at some point too many people infected, so it was difficult to find them on time. And for that, they, apart from the contact tracing, they set up also an emergency um, Ebola hotline, where people can basically call with any Ebola emergency, saying that somebody's sick or somebody is dead, or just asking for information, because, because education is very, very important here too. Some people didn't know what Ebola was, or didn't even believe it existed. OK. so. How does JavaScript enter the equation? Um, I work for eHealth e Africa. This is a Nigerian-based NGO that uh, tries to help uh, vulnerable communities, mostly in West Africa, live healthier lives. And part of it has been helping with the Ebola outbreak. Um, we first went to Nigeria because we are Nigeria-based, and things were somehow OK, pretty OK, so we were asked to go to also Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. So what do we did? Um, one of the first things we did was, in Nigeria, we realized the way contact tracing was working was there was this team of people, the contact tracers, that go to visit the contacts at home, and they use paper forms. You know how paper forms was, works. It's, it's slow to enter the information, and there's no error checking. There's, paper doesn't complain if you don't feel a mandatory field. And also, paper is easy to lost, or it can be destroyed, like what if it gets wet, for example. And also, it travels slow. You have to bring it to, to the place you wanted to go. The place you wanted to be was what is called the Emergency Operations Center. There is where they take the information and they decide what to do with it. And they also try to digitalize it, so you can do analytics or plan the strategy further. This is also like taking all this paper of uh, all this um, paper and put it in an application is also error prone and slow and something we humans suck at. However, uh, you can do just a simple application 
where the contact tracer will, have, will select the name of the person they are following up with, and they can just fill out the symptoms. And as a bonus, once you save it, the phone can save the GPS coordinates of uh, the place you are, so you can be sure that the contact tracer actually visited the pe person. Um, this can synchronize to the database, and you have the data digitalized very fast. And we could then provide also another tool for the emer emergency operations center that allows to have real-time information about what's happening. For example, if somebody has developed symptoms, you can see they are highlighted in red. I also mentioned the, the call center. Um, for the call center, it was even more extreme because they are receiving more information. S they were using different things, uh, ranging from paper to Excel to some applications we were not so happy with. But imagine, for example, paper. You are receiving all these calls from people that are very stressed, and you have to write everything very fast, and then the next call comes, and you have your paper that is piling up, and then somebody has to go there and have to filter the calls that were actually cut or the calls that were just asking for information from the calls that says, there is somebody dead at my place, and like my son has died, and he has been here for two days, and somebody has to pick the, the course because this is in infectious. So um, we created an application where they can enter the information much easily, and where the different teams that you see here, like the burial team, ambulance team, quarantine team, can just filter the information they want. We can prioritize it for them. Um, they can clean duplicates and this kind of stuff. These two applications are pretty simple, but they, they manage to, to make the process faster. With the mobile applications, we reduce the response time from 12 hours to almost instantly, like as instantly as the network connection was working. In the case of the call center, um, there was an article the other day saying that all the improvements in the call center have managed to reduce the response time from an average of five days to one day over a year. It was not only the software. There were many other improvements. But well, five days is pretty bad if you are sick and you have to be taken to a hospital. But this is not very complicated, right? It's a bunch of web forms, a bunch of API calls. And yeah, we know how to do that. We are web developers. This is a two-minute job. However, we have some constraints that make our life a little bit more difficult, like between a bit more difficult and a living hell sometimes. <laughs> um, there is no always internet, or sometimes there is, but it's too slow. You never know. It's unreliable, so one thing we know for sure is that our applications have to work offline. Fortunately, we have the help of some awesome piece of technology, CouchDB. <laughs> I don't know if you know CouchDB. CouchDB is a non-SQL database, document-based, um, that allows you to, to do map reduce operations also using JavaScript on the data and has a HTTP API for accessing the data, and is designed with distributed systems in mind. And this part about the HTTP API means that CalCDB can actually be your backend. And in our case, this is, this is what we did. CalCDB is our backend, so we don't have to implement this part. The only part missing here is the offline capabilities. But then we had the help from PulseDB, which is also an awesome open source project that provides you with a um, CalcDB compatible um, database within your browser. We added a little bit of Angular to the mix. And it allowed us to, to move very fast and to be super flexible with the data we were handling. Um, so fast that the first prototype of our contact tracing app was ready in three days the prototype, and same for the call center. But both of them were in production doing something within a week. The code was somehow crappy, and we have to stand it, and we have to fix it. But it helped, and a few weeks later, Ebola was um, eradicated from Nigeria, and we were asked to go to these other countries that where the emergency was much worse. And there were two things that were different in, in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and and Liberia in comparison with Nigeria. One is that infrastructure is even worse, so internet is even less reliable. And the other one is that the scale of the outbreak was completely different. So we started having some problems. I, here, you can see the difference between, you cannot see even the 
the numbers in Nigeria because they are neg negligible in comparison with Sierra Leone. In Nigeria, um, there, was, there were 20 cases of Ebola in total. In Sierra Leone, um, at the worst moment, there were 500 new cases per week. A case is um, a person that is sick. So 500 new sick people per week. What we were doing at the beginning was simply following the PouchDB tutorial. There is a method that works awesome that just replicates CouchDB, your CouchDB database in your browser. You have all your data available, and you can work as if you were offline, online all the time. But we started noticing that at some point, this was not working quite well. First, the browser complained, look, this is too much space. You are being too greedy. Um, different browsers have different limits, but yeah. We, we sort of ignore this problem and decide, OK, so we'll just support Chrome that let us use 6% of the hard drive. Yeah, that didn't quite work out. Because <laughs> the next thing is that the replication started being super slow. What it was 10 minutes became 20 minutes, then 40 minutes. And that was in Berlin, in Liberia or Sierra Leone, with more latency and with worse internet. Sometimes it was not even finishing. So we were crazy trying to improve this and fix it. And then we saw this which is like Chrome saying, OK, I give up. I actually thought it was very funny the first time. It was like, oh, I totally own Chrome. But <laughs> I thought it was just in my development machine. But no, it was in production. Not so funny. What we found is that there was a problem with the replication in CouchDB. And this is an issue filled by the PouchDB, one of the PouchDB core developers for the CouchDB guys. And it's a lot of information. I'm not sure you can read it. But to s like a summary is that if you want to replicate 10,000 documents, which is not so much, you can request batches of 500 documents, for example. So you will assume in 20 requests, or more or less, I have my data. However, the way replication works means that you have to do one request per document. So 10,000 documents, 10,000 requests. If you are using cores, as we will, um, then you have double the number of requests. So 10,000 documents is not too much. 20,000 requests is a lot. OK, so problems of scaling. Um, you replicate your whole database. That can take too much space or being too slow. Or it can even cross your browser because of the number of requests. We did a custom solution to fix this third one. I'm not going to tell you because apparently this is already fixed in CouchDB and PouchDB. And they are going to release it very soon. So they will do it better than us. But for the other two, my advice is think twice about you just using this thing. Think twice about what you really need to replicate. Use your domain knowledge. As an example, for our contact tracing mobile application, as I said, it was just a drop down with names. And then you fill up the symptoms, right? So we were replicating everything. And then we realized, OK. Why do we need all these documents? Actually, we don't need any contact after three weeks, because then they are not contacts anymore, because the incubation period is over. One particular contact tracer only works in one area, not in the whole country. And if people turn out to be infected, then they are not follow up anymore. So I don't need these contacts either there. If you just change from replicating everything to just replicating this subset, it's already a huge improvement. We even went further and we thought, like, OK, but we don't even need all the documentation, all the information about this contact. We just need names and IDs. So just to show you the kind of creative solutions you can make, this is what we did. This is uh, the remote database, and this is a document. We were using one document per person, which is not the best choice. I will tell you how to do better afterwards. But basically, we created an index in the remote database with names and IDs. And we were requesting that index and creating manually a local database, a this lookup database. And that's all the mobile phone needs from the remote database. The rest of the work is you can do offline, and the, the phone can add more follow-up information. And it can be synchronized once you have internet. In this case, the documents are different in the store database and in the remote database. So you have to do some custom logic, too. But this is due to the fact that our data model is not ideal. I will tell you more later. In a completely different example, we have the call center, where the data set is much bigger. So we tried to reduce it. But the smallest data set was still way too big. 
And also, we were doing something funny here, because I told you that with the contact tracing and the dashboard application, we were speeding up the, the time the paper information will arrive to the operation centers from 12 hours to almost in instantly, right? In here, in the call center, it was different. We have people working side by side, people receiving calls and people sending ambulances, for example. And if I take my, my call and put it on paper, I can just hand it to the person sending the ambulance. However, the way we were doing it was sending the information all the way to the internet and back. And if there is no internet in two hours, it takes two hours to transfer the information. So that didn't make so much sense. What we realized is that we were sort of trying to solve a software problem for the sake of sol solving the problem somehow. We didn't need PulseDB in that particular case. We just needed a database available at all times. So what about in every call center, you just have a local CouchDB database? And CouchDB is very good at synchronizing between databases. So whenever there is internet, these databases will synchronize. Actually, that even allows us to have call centers in places with no internet at all because you can hire a dedicated telephone line between call centers, and then it would be the second call center responsibility to synchronize to the, to the cloud. As a colleague of mine says, like, building offline applications is basically building distributed systems. So my advice is solve real world problems, not software problems, and just replicate what you need. The second problem you might find when working with offline applications is conflicts between documents. What do I mean? So again, this is our remote database, our contact tracer forms. Imagine for simplicity that they can only contact to internet at night. So at night of day two, they replicate the remote database to the local phones. And then day three, one of the contact tracers go to follow up on the person. At night on day three, there is no internet for some reason. Day four, the other contact tracers go to follow up on the person. And then at night again, they synchronize. And it times is, it, this time it works. But what CouchDB says is like, guys, OK, I have one document, and you both have modified it. And I have no idea which one of you is right. So CouchDB feels um, like mark this as a conflict, and it's for you to decide what to do, which is fine. You can do that. But you don't even need that if you have a proper data model. Um, what if you have your documents structured in a way that things that change together are together, and things that change separately are separated? For example, we have a document with personal information and one document for each follow-up. This way, there is never going to be conflicts, because the fonts are just creating new documents. And these documents can be synchronized with PouchDB synchronization directly without any custom logic. So no conflicts. And also, this keeps the number of revisions low. Revisions is the, the different versions of a document. So less revisions mean better replication and less storage. So choose your data model wisely. And the last thing I want to tell you about is data loss. This is like the nightmare of every offline application. We found for a different application that was registering people for a vaccination trial that um, we just have to collect some personal information and take a picture, and that will print a car, and, and they are registered. And we realized some people have cars, but they are not in our database. And the problem we figured was that some of the phones were deleting the information before replicating to CouchDB. And we discover that IndexDB, that is the storage we use for, for the browser, is temporary storage, which is pretty bad. The way it works in Chrome is this is your available, this is your hard drive, and this is your available space. And Chrome can use one third of it. And every single application within Chrome can use up to 20% of it. If you have a computer, 500 gigas, this is quite a lot of space. But if you have a phone, this is maybe not so much. What happens when all the space that Chrome has available gets used is that Chrome decides to delete the entire data for the less recently used one. 
So we thought, OK, but we still have a lot of space. Why will Chrome delete our application? And then we remember, oh, wait. This application is taking pictures. And probably nobody is deleting those pictures. I never do. So we are shrinking the space available in disk. And at some point, maybe our application didn't have, was the less recently used, and Chrome has to wipe it out. <laughs> so be careful with this. We are investigating if we can use another storage. So that were our, some of our mistakes. We did more mistakes. We will do more mistakes still. But it was worth it, and it was a lot of fun. We discovered most of the mistakes we did was because this was state of the art text, so we didn't know so much about it. It was new for us, and it was new for the internet too. Not so many posts in Stack Overflow, not 50 different tutorials about how to scale. So, yeah, we learn a lot in the process. What I can really recommend you if you work with a state of the art technology is get an expert. Um, we were lucky as to have one of the core developers of CouchDB joining us. He didn't arrive on time from prevent us of doing all the mistakes, but he helped us fixing it. <laughs> He's laughing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, don't forget that you have the community. Um, all these are open source projects, and the people who, who are developing them are very passionate about it. And if you have an, an interesting project and you are pushing the limits, and if you are nice, of course, remember to be nice, <laughs> they, they will probably help you. And, and you can help them. You can fill bugs. You can fix bugs if you feel that you can do it. Or you can just add documentation in the internet so they, cannot they, cannot, uh, they don't need to keep repeating the same stuff over and over. So I talk a lot about, about, <laughs> I talk a lot about um, deaths and sick people. And this is a pretty sad topic. But I wanted to finish with a little bit brighter note. I'm going to show you the status of the Ebola outbreak in Africa. Um, there is two new cases this week in Guinea, which is very good in comparison with what was happening before. Um, no new cases in Sierra Leone. There is hope for the outbreak to finish, maybe. And the outbreak ended in Liberia and Nigeria already. Mm. <laughs> I know that our JavaScript application didn't finish the outbreak, but I, I like to think that we help and we save some lives, even if only a few. And I can totally recommend to work in a, in a project with impact. However, we shouldn't have stopped here. Um, Ebola was quite a hype sickness because it's pretty terrible. But there are many other sickness that nobody is caring so much about. We are also doing now some work in polio. Maybe we'll do with missiles afterwards. There is always a lot of things you can do. Or you can even um, don't work just in emergencies. You can prepare for when the emergencies arrive. As the Time magazine said, this won't be the last epidemic. And when the next one comes, the world must learn the lesson of this one. Be better prepared, less fearful, less reactive. Run toward the fire and put it out together. Thank you. <laughs>